In this video, we'll take a look at the Heathkit AR2 communications receiver. The AR2 was a shortwave or communications radio receiver offered in kit form. The basic features were the following. A general coverage receiver covering 535 kHz to 35 MHz in four bands. A slide rule tuning dial with amateur radio bands indicated. Main tuning control as well as uncalibrated band spread tuning. Volume and power control built-in loudspeaker and headphone jack, phone standby and CW mode switch, RF gain control, switchable automatic volume control or AVC, fixed beat frequency oscillator or BFO, switchable noise limiter, and external antenna and ground inputs. It was offered only as a kit of all parts that the user would assemble. The detailed assembly manual allowed someone with limited electronics experience to assemble it. Alignment required a meter such as a VTVM and a signal generator, although you could align it by ear without a meter if necessary. It used six vacuum tubes as follows. A 12BE6 oscillator mixer, a 12BA6 IF amplifier, 12AV6 second detector and first audio amplifier, 12A6 audio output, 12BA6 beat frequency oscillator, and a 5Y3 rectifier. It ran on 105 to 125 volts AC, 50 or 60 hertz. A European export model used a transformer that could be wired for 220 volts. Power usage was 45 watts and the kit shipping weight was 12 pounds, the receiver itself weighing about 9 pounds. The AR2 was sold by Heathkit from 1953 to 1955 at a US price of $25.50, not including the cabinet equivalent to about $280 today. An optional wooden fabric covered cabinet was an additional $4.50. Heathkit didn't publish any specifications for receiver sensitivity or selectivity. It was advertised as an ideal companion to the Heathkit AT1 transmitter. The AR2 is considered to be quite rare as it was only offered for a few years and most units have long since been discarded. The AR2 was preceded by the AR1, which was offered from 1949 to 1953 at a price of $25.50 and was the first shortwave receiver kit offered by Heathkit. The AR1 was similar to the AR2, but with slightly different band coverage. It lacked a built-in speaker, band spread tuning, BFO, RF gain and AVC controls, headphone jack and noise limiter. Unlike the AR2, it did have a tone control phono input, and pilot light. The successor to the AR2 was the AR3, sold from 1955 to 1961 at a price of $27.95. It reduced the tube count by 1 to 5, added an antenna trimmer control and pilot lamp, and it used better coils and IF transformers to improve selectivity. It also added an octal accessory socket which supported the optional QF1Q multiplier. My unit lacks the case and front panel and doesn't have the original knobs, as I'll explain later. Front panel controls include the power and volume control at the left of the dial and the main tuning at the right. Tuning is shown on a large slide rule dial. The dial has four bands. Band A is the AM broadcast band from 435 to 1550 kHz. Band B is short wave from 1.46 MHz to 4 MHz. The 160 and 80 meter amateur radio bands are highlighted in red. Band C is short wave from 3.6 to 10.7 MHz with the 80 and 40 meter ham bands marked. Band D goes from 10.5 to 36 MHz and includes the 20, 15, 11, and 10 meter ham bands. Note that the dial indicates KC or kilocycles and MC for megacycles as was common at the time. The 11 meter band was allocated to amateur radio at the time but was later changed to the citizens band. At the bottom left is the RF gain control which also switches the AVC on and off. Next to it is the mode switch which selects between phone mode for normal AM operation, standby which mutes the receiver typically when used with a transmitter and CW, which turns on the BFO. The band switch selects between one of the four bands. Finally, the band spread control adjusts fine tuning. It's not calibrated, 
but the original unit would have had a small dial pointer on the shaft to indicate the relative position. The radio is typically aligned such that the dial is correct with the band spread in its center position. At the left is the built-in loudspeaker. On the rear panel, from left to right, are the terminals for ground and antenna connection, the line cord, noise limiter on-off switch, and headphone jack which mutes the speaker when headphones are plugged in. If the owner didn't opt to purchase or construct a case, it could be used just as a chassis, although there is AC line voltage exposed at the back of the power control. I've covered mine with electrical tape. Under the chassis, there are voltages as high as 300 volts DC. It's also not fused or grounded. Needless to say, it doesn't meet current electrical safety standards for new products. The radio is a pretty standard superhead design. The power supply uses a transformer and a 5Y3 tube is used as a full wave rectifier with an RC filter to generate high voltage of about 300 volts. The tubes have 12.6 volt filaments powered by another winding on the transformer except for the 5Y3, which is a 5-volt filament with its own winding. A single tube acts as an oscillator and mixer to convert the incoming signal to the 455 kHz IF frequency. There's a single stage of IF amplification with two IF transformers. Another tube is the detector and first audio amplifier and optional noise limiter. The BFO uses a dedicated tube and is fixed in frequency. Finally, a 12A6 is the audio output which drives the loudspeaker or headphones. The main tuning uses a variable capacitor as well as a band spread tuning capacitor used for fine tuning which is uncalibrated. Both caps have vernier drives built in. Note that it used a mix of octal and miniature tube types. It features a copper plated chassis and coil turret assembly. Notable components on the top of the chassis include the power transformer, main tuning capacitor, coil turret assembly, loudspeaker, the tubes, and the two IF transformers. It also would originally have had a large electrolytic capacitor can mounted on the chassis. Looking underneath the chassis, all the wiring is point to point using terminal strips, tube sockets, and switches and controls. The front end tuning circuits and band switch are part of a shielded assembly which connects to the chassis using the band switch shaft. Other components under the chassis include the band spread capacitor, speaker output transformer, BFO coil, and antenna and oscillator coils. The two large electrolytic capacitors are modern replacement parts. Audio signals going to and from the volume control are shielded using a spring-like coil material the manual referred to as Spira Shield. Alignment required a DC voltmeter, such as a VTVM or VOM, as well as an RF signal generator. The manual suggested the Heathkit V6 and SG7 as being ideal. If no meter was available, the radio could be aligned by ear. The IF transformers were pre-adjusted at the factory. The align procedure consists of first peaking the IF transformers with a signal set for 455 kHz. Then each band is aligned by adjusting an oscillator trimmer for the band for the correct dial reading and then peaking the antenna trimmer for the band. Alignment starts with the highest frequency band D and works down to band A. The trimmers for band D are on the tuning capacitor and the others are located on the coil turret assembly. The broadcast band A has an additional adjustment to the oscillator coil. Finally, the BFO is adjusted for a comfortable tone using a 2 MHz signal. Adjustments are done using a voltmeter on the AVC line to adjust for a peak. It's recommended not to fully install the loudspeaker until after the alignment as it interferes with access to the trimmers. The AR3 model changed the orientation of the coils and trimmers to avoid this. I bought this unit at an estate auction run by a local radio club. It was a sorry looking chassis with parts missing and appeared to be a Heathkit AR2. I was able to pick it up for $1 and thought it could at least be used for spare parts. Examining it more closely, I realized that all the unique or critical parts were there and it might be feasible to restore it. The power and other transformers were good and the tuning caps were present. The other parts should all be obtainable. I decided to totally tear it down to the bare metal chassis and see if I could rebuild it according to the instructions in the manual. The chassis was quite rusty. I spray painted it with copper paint which made it look almost new. 
It was necessary to scrape the paint away at any points that need to be grounded, like connections to terminal strips or tube sockets, as the paint is not conductive. I replaced the existing electrolytic capacitor can, which was not the original, with three new caps mounted under the chassis on a terminal strip. Most capacitors were replaced with modern units. I kept the original mica caps as they tend not to fail over time. All resistors were also replaced with new ones. A few were higher wattage, but I had them all on hand. It had no speaker or output transformer. I was fortunate to find a speaker and transformer from another junk radio that was pretty much an exact match, right down to the position of the mounting holes. The missing line cord was replaced by a new brown two-wire extension cord with the end cut off. All the tubes were missing, but they're relatively common ones. I'm a member of a vintage radio club that has a stock of tubes that they sell for a few dollars each and all of them were available. Two potentiometers were missing. The power and volume is a one megaohm audio taper with a switch. These are still available new. More challenging was the RF gain AVC control, which is a 10K linear pot with an unusual single pull double throw switch with the switch controlled at the maximum clockwise position. After some research, I found a pot with a push pull switch that would work as a substitute. As the shaft was very short, I had to extend it using an extender that I had in my junk box. I also selected some suitable knobs using what I had available. The main tuning capacitor has an internal vernier drive, which is common in Heathcote equipment, and is often the case with these, it was locked up. It took several applications of liquid wrench and twisting with pliers to free it up. There was also a wire broken on the BFO coil, which I fixed. There were no full copies of the manual on the internet, and I needed the full manual in order to rebuild it. I ordered a printed manual from Manual Man, which I've ordered from before, and are high-quality reproductions of the original Heathkit manuals. Following the manual steps, I rebuilt the unit from the ground up, which was quite satisfying as it recreated the experience of building a Heathkit from the early 1950s, following the manual and checking off each step as it was completed. With all of the point-to-point -point wiring, there was a significant amount of labor to assemble it, maybe 10 hours total done over several evenings. Some component changes like the RF gain control and electrolytic caps required some adjustments to the assembly. When I was finally done, I started by checking the power supply voltages with the unit powered up slowly using a variac. Then I put the remaining tubes in. It worked. I followed the alignment procedure, which went well but was a little confusing in some places. The only issue I ran into was a dead band C, which was due to one of the oscillator coils being intermittently open and needing to be resoldered. I printed some labels for the control since I don't have the original front panel. I don't know the history of this radio, but it must have been purchased and assembled by someone in the early 1950s, and judging by the wear on the dial scale, it worked and was regularly used. At some point they must have scavenged it for some parts and set it aside. This is one of only two Heathkits that I totally tore down and rebuilt, the other being an AT1 transmitter, which coincidentally was the suggested transmitter to use with the AR2. This was a basic shortwave receiver suitable for amateur radio use, although tedious to tune without a calibrated band spread and poor selectivity. You can see how small a portion of the dial most of the hand bands took up. The radio was such that a teenager wanting to get into shortwave or ham radio could purchase the kit with money made mowing lawns for a summer and was significantly less than a fully assembled radio. I also own an AR3 and the optional QF1 Q multiplier and have made YouTube videos about them. With this unit, I now have all of the Heathkit general coverage receivers except the AR1, which is very rare.